Because the base 
current, as long, for as long as you remain in the forward active region, is one plus beta times smaller than the, the, than the emitter voltage. And to maintain the same voltage draw, you have to basically multiply or divide by one plus beta. So, what is the resistance I see here? It's the total resistance to the emitter, namely this term, times one plus beta. And when you do that, so it's basically one plus beta times alpha Rm plus Re, where the first term becomes basically simply R pi, and the second term becomes one plus beta Re. Which again, your book like, looks, likes to show as R pi, again, this becomes an approximation uh, because of an alpha difference, which doesn't really matter. Uh, one plus uh, GMRE. So what they like to do is to say that while well, it's, it's the resistance of the input resistance of the non-degenerate case increasing by this factor of one plus GMRE, which is the same factor by which the gain dropped. So you see, you, there's a trade-off here. You, you reduce your gain, but you gain your input resistance by exactly the same factor. And you can look at this several different ways. You can think about that some sort of local feedback. You can look at it, and we'll do that at some point when we talk about feedback. But um, that's basically just it. So the way I like to think about it is that whatever I have in the emitter multiplied by beta, or more accurately, beta plus one, but beta is not good enough for me. Um, and if I want to move something from the base to the emitter, I divide it by beta. Now, how about R out? We did calculate the R out, and you saw that it was, again, consisted of two parts. So this was R in and R out. So there was the extrinsic part and the intrinsic part. So the extrinsic part was, of course, RC, and the intrinsic part now was R01 plus GM RE, well, divided by alpha, really, but it doesn't matter, 1 plus GM RE over beta. And we saw that increasing RE does increase the intrinsic part of the output resistance. However, there's a limit to it. It's saturated with beta RO. It can't go above beta RO. Okay? So that was the basic common amenity discussion. Now we had the then we talked about the common collector or the emitter follower. Now, the common collector can be defined. Um, more accurately, as a stage whose input is the base and the output is the middle. So, the easy way to do it was like this. If we had some RE here, this was VCC, V in, V out. And if you look at it from a small signal perspective, you saw that if you have a V in here and a V out there, it's like, kind of like voltage value. So, so I want you to, I mean, we've done this calculation before, we did it last time, but I want you to look at it and see how I do it this time. And to gain a sense of what, how you can gain intuition about this, how you can get a sense or feel for these devices. So it's simple. I mean, I look at this, well, you know, I really have an alpha RM here. Even if I have some sort of source resistance, so let's put the source resistance in there too, RB, or base resistance, right? So I said, well, if this is Vn, the voltage before Rb, so it's here, maybe, it's really divided between these three resistors, this one, this one, and that one, right? And they said, well, but this resistor is in the base, and this, these guys are in the emitter, so I can move this to the emitter, and divide it by 1 plus beta, right? So if I take it to the emitter, so there would be a 1 plus beta, Rb divided by 1 plus beta, there would be an alpha Rm, and there is an Re, so there's a voltage divider, there's a chain of three resistors. And I have to calculate the gain, or more accurately, the loss of that voltage divider, which would be this resistor divided by the sum of the three resistors, Re plus alpha Rm plus Rb over 1 plus beta. So that's my gain, voltage gain. Right? There are three, so I can, I, in my mind, I'm doing this. For as long as it's on the emitter side. If I take it out and want to put it on the base side, it gets multiplied by 1 plus beta, so it becomes R pi. So if I were to put it here, I do R pi. But I do one or the other, I don't do both. Again, it doesn't mean much the way I've shown it. I mean, technically speaking, just the way of getting.
any sense about what the small signal model really is. And whenever you are in doubt, you can always go back to the small signal model and look at it. And if whenever you are in doubt about the validity of the small signal model, you can go back to nonlinear equations. And, and whenever you are in doubt about those, you can go back to the device physics equations and look at those. And whenever you are in doubt about those, you can go to the transport equations for electrons and all those things. And if you are in doubt about those, you can go back to quantum mechanics and go back to but, but you won't do that, right? That's the whole point. My point here is that you want to be able to operate at this level of abstraction and not go down to those levels for as long as you can. Otherwise, it becomes impossible to do with a circuit with, you know, 100 transistors in it. Okay, so that was the basic game. Now, R in and R out, so let's do that quickly too. R in. What is R in? Well, again, the same mentality. I want to look at things from the base perspective. So this guy is in the base, I don't need to touch it. I don't need to do much about that. So RB is already there. Now I said I could move this here and look at it as an R pi, because it gets multiplied by 1 plus beta. And I can move this guy up and multiply by 1 plus beta. So that's why it took resistance. Now how about the output resistance, R out? Well, I know the rule for these input and output resistances. I have a source here, so I have to ground this. I mean, null source, which is a multi source, so it becomes ground. So again, and then I can move everything to the emitter side. So if this, this, this guy is moved to the emitter side, I know it's going to be RB divided by 1 plus beta. Okay? So that one is shorted on the other side of the base. So I have alpha RM in series with that smaller resistor, RB divided by beta, in parallel with RE. So my output resistance is going to be RE in parallel with alpha Rm plus Rb divided by 1 plus theta, moving everything to the emitter side. So as you can see, there's no need to draw a small signal model for everything. And I encourage you to think about, start with trying to think about these stages in these terms, because later on, you'll be able to deal with kind of another level of abstraction when we start with dealing with them individually, I mean, a large number of them. Okay, so that was the common emitter. And we saw that the gain was less than 1, but it had a high input impedance and low output impedance. And therefore, uh, what it allowed you to do is to be a, it allowed you to use it as a voltage buffer. So uh, it could proceed or succeed basically uh, a gain stage with a low input impedance and high output impedance. Okay, now the last stage we looked at was common base which was basically where you apply the uh, input to the emitter and took the output out of the collector. And you kept the base at some constant bias to make sure that it remains in forward active region, that the transistor remains. Uh, so this is V out, and this was V in. And in, in general, we have some sort of source resistance. V in. And we basically saw that in general, basically what you have, you have a voltage um, gain, which was basically from here to alpha was GMRC. It was non-inverting stage, right? And it should be surprising, it's the gain, very similar to the gain of the common emitter, GMRC, right? If, you, if R was large. Because it is like this common emitter, except for the fact that instead of wiggling this, keeping this one constant and wiggling this one, Right? You're keeping this one constant and we make this one. So you're changing the base emitter voltage. From that, from the gain perspective, it's resulting in the same change, and therefore the gain is the same except for the fact that the polarity is changed because now you're wiggling the other terminal. So it becomes a non-inverting gain. Now, how about the input and output impedance? So if I look at the input impedance from this perspective, from this point on, or in, it's simple, right? What, what do I see? Well, from, from a small signal perspective, the constant voltage is what? Short. Short, right? So this guy from an AC perspective is short. What do I see looking into the emitter? Again, think about this as that little resistor alpha or in there. From a small signal perspective. For perturbations, for small changes, that's what it is. So R in is basically alpha or in. Right? How about R out? Well, we have already done this calculation once. If you look at R out, basically again the rule for R out is not all independent sources, not in this guy is shorted in here. And what well, we have the extrinsic part, which is the RC, and the 
you have to look at the intrinsic part, which looks exactly the same as that of the common mirror, which we have calculated. So it becomes basically RC in parallel with RO, and 1 plus GM RS divided by 1 plus GM RS over beta. Okay. Now, the gain, more accurately, is this is an approximate gain if RC is small. But if it's not small, it's going to be that in parallel with R out, this R out. Well, one second. It's GM R out, because it has all the really RC. Or, in other words, GM RC in parallel with R O 1 plus GM RS divided by 1 plus GM RS over B. Now, the point, the interesting point about this to note is that if you make RC very large and try to get a large, relatively large RS, then you can actually, the intrin maximum intrinsic gain of the state is GM R O times beta, which is greater than that of the common emitter. And we'll see how this is useful to get the maximum gain out of a single stage when we try to do that today. Okay, so let's keep, the, keep these keys here. So, let's do a quick review what we said last time. Now, let's start building stuff, right? So one of the interesting things we notice is that this state has a very low input impedance. And if I want to get a re relatively large gain, I need to get a relatively high source impedance, RS. Whatever drives it should look more like a current source than a voltage source, right? Because current sources have higher sources. By the way, if I show you a box, of course you know this, right? If I show you a box, well, a two-terminal box, say, well, is this a current source or a voltage source? What would you say? Well, what would you do to determine that? What would you do if to determine this? But if I tell you, either it's a kind of a voltage source thingy or a current source thingy, but they're not ideal. What, what, what do we do to determine which one it is? Measure the resistance. Measure the input resistance, in, internal resistance. And how do you decide so whether it's a current source or a voltage source? It's infinite. It should be a current source. So if that, that's, that's for ideal current source, right? Or if it's zero, it's a voltage source. But let's say it's not ideal. Well, it's going to be massive, the resistance. OK, what is massive? Is 1K massive? Is 10K massive? Is 10 ohms massive? No, let, let's say somehow you can measure it, right? Let's say we can, can measure it, right? Somehow I can measure the internal resistance of this thing. Oh, oh it sounds like can you just like put a resistor at the terminal and measure the current? Right, sure. That's how you measure. I mean, you need to do multiple points and then you can basically determine what the voltage is. But you can get an internal resistance, right? You get an internal resistance. Let's say it comes out to be one kilo. Is it the current source or the voltage source? Depends on what circuit you connect it to, right? Kind of, right. So, exactly. So that's a good way of thinking about it. It doesn't mean much. I mean, I mean technically, unless it's zero or infinity, it's all relative, right? It's all relative. So, one kilo ohm could be massive, or could be nominal, could be nothing. Depending on what it's connected to. Well, one, one K is massive, it's connected to one ohm. One K is nothing, so it's connected to one big ohm. And you can have to think of situations, and there are situations, both situations kind of same numbers can have. And that really goes back to what something that's going to come back from the basic network theory. Of course, you are familiar with it. Thevenin and Norton equivalent. Any two port has a Thevenin and Norton equivalent. So you can take any two port and show it two different ways. Let's say it's a DC thing. So either you can show it this way, or show it that way. And from a circuit perspective, There's no way to tell which one is which from an outside perspective, right? These two are equivalent from a voltage and current perspective, right? right? So it could be a current source, it could be a voltage source. So what the question I ask is a meaningless question. I ask a meaningless question and kind of put you in a difficult situation. In life, it happens a lot of time, right? They try to force you into this kind of false dichotomies and have to make a decision between this and that, right? the wrong dichotomy. It forces you to make a decision between the current source and the voltage source, right? It was neither. Right? It means yes or no.
no answer. Or something, right? No. Yeah, the correct answer is always no. <laughs> if in doubt, it's no. But, uh, all right. Now, so these two are equivalent, right? So what I said, this is a current, I need a current source. What I should have said instead, I need a higher high impedance source. High impedance compared to what? To drive this. Compared to the source resistance of the voltage. Well, that is the source resistance of the voltage. Because I could, basically what I meant is that I can take this out and replace it with this. And nobody will notice. Right. Nobody with a voltmeter or ammeter will notice. Right. So what I'm talking about is that I want this to be large. A source of resistance. Compared to what? Compared to what's driving. Why? Because if it's large compared to Rm or alpha Rm, then what happens is that most of this current will go through alpha Rm. That's why it needs to be large. Okay? Otherwise, if it's small compared to alpha or most of the current will circulate internally and nothing, alpha or will get very low current. So the current is wasted locally. So it has to be large compared to that. Now, let me ask you, we've been talking about them. You know how they have it relate to each other, right? If I give you this, you can make it an equivalent where IN is basically V fresh CN. Uh, that's for feminine divided by Rn. And in fact, every network, if you have a general network with two, with two terminals, which consists of multiple different components, right? So that's for now, let's say, all sorts of resistors and, some, and, independence, and dependent sources. So if you have resistors, dependent sources that depend on things inside this, independent sources, more resistors, and this is valid in general for impedances too. So if you have all of these things connected, you can reduce it to that for, low, for DC. Or at high frequencies, you can reduce it to a voltage source. And in general, it's an impedance inside. That's interesting, right? So I can say, I can take it, an infinitely complex network of resistors for now, let's talk about low frequencies. Resistors, Dependent sources, that, you know, all sorts of current and voltage dependent sources, independent sources, connected in all sorts of different ways, and I can reduce it to that. How do I determine those components? Well, it's easy. If I want to determine the, volt the feminine voltage, I take an ideal voltmeter, basically one with an infinite input resistance, and measure the voltage. And the voltage I measure is the feminine voltage. Right? And if I want to determine the resistance, what the, the equivalent resistance is, I know all the independent sources inside. Not the dependent sources. The independent sources, I know them, and measure the resistance between these two. And that's resistance. And in general, we can generalize it to impedances. They have a function of frequency. Now, that's exactly what we've been doing when we determine the output resistance and the input resistance. Right? There was not a single resistor there, but I said, well, what is the resistance between those? So what I did, I know my independent sources, and I applied a test voltage or test current and measured the other one. And that's exactly measuring the Thevenin resistance, or Norton resistance, doesn't matter. So then I do that, or if I want to determine the Norton equivalent, what I do, I short this here, I measure the current, basically I use an ideal ammeter, and that's my Norton current. And then the same way I measure the R in by knowing all the independent sources. So these two are equivalent from a certain perspective. And hence indistinguishable as black boxes from a certain perspective, from the current and voltage source perspective. Right? You agree to that, right? Now, so now a few years ago, you know Spectrum magazine, right? The IEEE Spectrum. They have this general magazine. There was this um, question. They have this interesting. The question was exactly this. That you are given two black boxes. One contains a current source impaled with a resistor. The other one contains a voltage source, voltage source in series with the same resistor. And they're thermally northern equivalent, so that that relationship holds between the two. And let's say this is an ideal current source, this is an ideal voltage source. And you are given these two 
and are to determine which one is which without opening the box. The first reaction was, well, that's what they taught us in the school, that they can't tell the difference between these. And that was the question, how do you tell the difference? Any thoughts? Well, of course, the first response is, I opened them, but kind of, I mean, you're not supposed to open so that. Depends on what field or perspective people can um... Okay, well, I didn't say what field or perspective. I didn't throw. I give you two boxes. You're not supposed to open them. Tell me which one's which. You swap the two boxes, give them back. <laughs> Well, uh, what to do next? <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. I was thinking it's a happy to be good with that. You're allowed to ask one question from a guy who may who always lies every other time. <laughs>
the driver stays and my VN is applied here. Now, what this does, it allows me to get a much higher intrinsic gain. Because the carbon base allowed me to do that, but it needed to be driven by a higher impedance source. And that's exactly what's happening now. Because if I look down here, my if new RS, which is the impedance looking down, the source resistance, is what? What is my new RS? Looking into the collector of it.
current has to be zero. So I can't buy a set. I mean, it doesn't have three variations. So I need to use something else instead of a resistor. What do I use? Current source, right? So if I if I did have an ideal current source, I could do something like this, and I know the gain of this would be G M R O of this guy with a minus sign, right? But unfortunately, nowhere in our discussion about the devices or you know, solid state physics, I introduced a component called the current source, right? We did not have a current source. We have transistors, we have diodes, we have resistors. We didn't have a current source. So you have to come up with something to approximate this. What would that be? Well, again, what do I mean by current source? I want high peaks at a given current, in other words. At a given DC current, I want high peaks. So, what gives me high impedance? Do I have something that gave me high time impedance that I used perhaps here? Because the transistor itself, right? The collector of the transistor. But I can't use another transistor. Well, can, let's see if I can do this. Can I connect another transistor like this here? I can, of course I can connect anything I want to anything, but it's more useful. Uh, the problem with this is that the DC current, remember, the collector current for this guy goes this way, the collector current for this guy goes this way, a forward active region. So this is not going to do me any good. So I need something that can source current instead of sink current while remaining in forward active region. What is that? PMP. A PMP, right? PMP was the complement of the NPN. So a PMP to be in common emitter, you remember for, for a PMP to be in common emitter, it had to be connected like this. So the basic PMP common emitter looked like that. This was V in, this was V out. This is the emitter. This is the basic collector. And the DC current flows this way. But now it's carried to both by, by a volts, but not, uh, not the electrons. So if I use a comp a, a PMP transistor up there, up there, connected to VCC, I can maintain a current, right? It, it, I can maintain a high impedance looking up. Let's call this output impedance if it's in forward active region ROP for PMP, right? The output resistance of the PMP transistor. Now, what do I need to do? What do I do with this for it to remain in the forward active region? It has to be at a constant voltage probably about 0.7 volt below VCC or something in that order to, for it to remain in the forward active region, right? For this junction to be forward bias. Now, that voltage has to be generated. Let's call that V bias. Now, for the sake of the discussion we have today and the next couple of, well, the next, I think, one or two lectures, we, I somehow assume that I magically can generate these V biases. Any value I want to use, right? So let's make that assumption. But then we'll come back to it and see exactly how we generate this. So for now, let's just assume that I, can, I have at my disposal this magic box that generates all sorts of these voltages that I want at any point. And then we'll come back and see, well, we don't have quite exactly that magic box, but we have some, a good approximation of it. And we'll see all sorts of different bias and techniques. So we'll spend a couple of lectures on that. But for now, let's talk about this without worrying about the bias. So every time I need a new voltage to be biased, all I need is just write down V bias 1, V bias 2, V bias 3, and also so on. So this is the V bias to maintain this in forward active region. And if I do that, what is the gain of this stage? What would the gain be? So this is V in, this is V out. Can you tell me the, what the gain of this stage is? We're just looking at. From a small signal perspective, let me ask you this question. From a small signal perspective, what is this whole thing? If you look into this thing, what do you see? If you're in doubt, you can look at the small signal model, right? If you look at the pi model, the pi model for this looks like r pi to ground, which is VCC, right? This is r pi p, really. Right? And this is connected to what? This is the V bias, so it's constant voltage, so it's ground. And then there's a GN P V pi to ground, and then there's R O P, right? This is ground. What is V pi? It's the voltage across the resistor. It's zero. So what is this guy? Yeah. 
Zero. So this whole thing is like a resistor to the ground of ROP. And that's why what I meant when I showed this. So this was exactly like saying, in my mind at least, that the resistance between this node and ground is ROP from if you look up. Does that make sense? It's a current source, right? I mean, it's a good approximation of a current source because ROP is a large resistance while you maintain whatever the DC current is. So, you have ROP looking up. Now, if I, look, if I have from a small signal perspective, whatever I look up is just a resistor. How is it different from that? It's not. All I need to do to get the result is what? Replace RC with ROP. Right? It's another, yet another resistor. It's another collector resistor. From a small signal perspective, it's just a resistor because these other things go away. And looking up, I see ROP. Looking down, I see ROM. That's one way, another way of thinking about it. So the game is GM ROM in pair with ROP. So my new RC is ROP. And I write R1, R1, the NTN is RON to make a distinction between R1 and R1. So that's my gate. Then this is the GMN. Because it's this guy that's amplifying. Another way of saying the same thing is that if I have a small perturbation V in here, this results in a current variation, which is GMVN, which is being pulled out of this node. What is the total impedance between this node and ground if you had null all the independent sources? If you have null all the independent sources, it means this one is null, that one is null. If this one is null, what you see looking down is just the RON. What you see looking up is just the ROP. So the total impedance of this node, or in other words, the output impedance of this state, is simply RON in parallel with ROP. And therefore, it's this GM driving that. The current is being pulled out of it, so you get one of Right? So I, need, I don't need to draw the small signal every time, and I intentionally am doing it this way. You're welcome to do it yourself to verify what I'm saying is true. If it doesn't make sense, and it will take some time for it to sink in. Right? You can get, feel comfortable with this way of thinking, but I want you to learn how to think this way. So, that's my game. So, I can also rewrite it in terms of some of the parameters I have, the large signal, the quiescent parameters. So, GN is IC over BT. And RON is what? So this is basically the product divided by the sum. RON is VAN, the early voltage of the NTN, divided by IC, times VAP, divided by IC, divided by VAN over IC, plus VAN, VAP over IC, right? That's a pair of combination, the product divided by the sum. Half of the harmonic uh, mean. You know what harmonic mean? You know? Well, there are different means, right? There's uh, arithmetic means, so it's like x plus y, and it's two. There's the geometric mean. Right, the harmonic mean is basically 2xy divided by x plus y. And you know why it's called the harmonic mean, right? Because if you actually have two strings, one with length x, the other one with length y. And if you want to get a frequency that's exactly one half, between the two frequencies, the length you have to choose is this harmonic mean. It happens when things are inversely proportional to something. The frequency is inversely proportional to the length on a given tension. And that's what they use on making a guitar, for instance. Right? If you look at a guitar, if you look at the frets, they're not equally spaced. The spacing is actually larger farther up and smaller closer to the value of actual Do you use R1 between the frequencies? Okay. So, this is also appears here in the parallel combination, is also kind of like one half of harmonic. In any case, so now let's see, let's let's look at these ICs. These two ICs cancel one of these ICs. Right? In the sum. And then this IC cancels that IC. 
So it's actually interesting being dependent on IC. 1 over VT times VAN, VAP divided by VAN plus VAP. So the gain of this thing is actually independent of the operation current. And it kind of makes sense because they impede it. if you lower the current, GM goes down, ROs go up by the same factor. So that's what it is. But let's calculate the gain. Let, let's do one, something, something number. So let's say I am operating with one millionaire on current, I see. And uh, I know it doesn't depend, my gain doesn't really depend on that, but that's necessary. And let's say my um, VAN is 100 volts. My VAP is usually smaller, so I'm going 50, let's say, for this, which could be smaller than that. So what's my gain? Let's calculate these numbers. Right? So let's calculate GN. I know I don't have to do it versus current, but let's do it. GNN is what? It's IC over VT. It's 1 milliamp. I know from 1 milliamp back to what GM is, right? 40 millisiemens. But let's do it. 25 millivolts, so that's 40 millisiemens, which is kind of the inverse of O, something called Mu. Um, 40 millisiemens, right? And RON, the output resistance of the N, is VAN divided by IC. So it's 100 volts divided by 1 milliamp, milli gives you a kilo, that becomes 100 kilo ohms. And ROP, by the same token, would be 50 kilo ohms. So my gain is the my output resistance, or L, is going to be the parallel combination of 50 and, 30 and 100 which is 150 divided by, I'm no, sorry, uh, 5,000 divided by 150, so that's a 100 divided by, 1,000 divided by 3, so that's, oh, okay, so that's 100 divided by 3, so that's 33 kilo. Okay? So the equivalent of output resistance is 33 kilo, which is reasonably high, which is not insanely high. We'll get to some insanely high resistance later, but... Um, reasonably high. Okay, it's okay. And GM is 40 millisiemens, so my gain, which is GM times that, it's 40 times 33, it's about, what, what's my gain? Yeah, close to 1,200. Let's say ballpark of 1,200. That's respectable. Right? One millivolt gives you a volt. But let's say I'm not satisfied. If I'm not satisfied with this, what do I do? Now, this is the first example of this design example we'll go through a little bit through this course. So let's say, look at the cross, we want to see the, to see the cross. What do I do now? How do I fix my, let's say I want more gain, for whatever reason. My boss is crazy, or you know, I'm crazy myself, or, or both, or, or on a remote possibility that what the customer wants needs more gain. Or, no, it's not remote. So I'm 
I'm trying to take, dry the water and then take a look at the water and then there's a big, big, big rock in there. Right? So I have to go after that first. I have to take out the big rock. So what is limiting my game? Oh, yeah, resistance, right? I want a higher resistance. Now, if I were to fix it, which one would I fix? The lower one. The lower one, right? Of course, I'm, it's, it's kind of makes a little less sense to go and fix this one while I have a 50, you know, like that, right? Maybe very appealing, like in real life. Sometimes you do that too. Fix things there. Okay. But, now let's, let's see. So, how do I fix that? I need something that gives me a higher impedance than R0. Do I have something like that? Did I have something that had an intrinsic resistance higher than R0? It's not completely 
artificial, right? There is a justification for getting as, for getting as much gain as possible in as few stages as possible. So this is actually a useful thing you're doing. When you're making an offhand, for example, you want to get as much gain in as few stages as possible. Because that affects your stability. And we'll see that later on. But, so this is not completely useless. So, again, I took out the big rock, right? Out of my pond. The water level went down. Now I have another rock I'm showing you, which was not there. Which I couldn't see. Well, it wasn't. It was there, but I couldn't see it. It always thought, it's always like that. Engineering is like that. You start with the big first order problem, you solve it, and then you probably you see two or three second order problems. You start solving them, you have 20 third order problems. And by that time, you say, well, okay, you know, I don't want to go and chase every little you know, uh, waterfall. Uh, or rainbow. Okay. okay, anyway. So, but still, I mean, I say, well, I need more game. By the way, yeah, right? Because now, this guy, that was the good guy, because I've improved this one so much, now this is the culprit. This R-O-N is the culprit. What do I do about that? Another cascode. Yeah, there's another cascode. That cascode up there, you look at it. That's actually exactly what I want. I mean, it's an NPM version of that. So if I replace my single NPM transistor with that guy, I should be able to get higher gain. So let's do that. So this is my input P in. This is P bias 1, well, let's call it P bias 3, P bias 2, P bias 1, and VCC. This is my output. So first of all, what is the impedance? The output impedance. Well, what is the impedance looking up? That doesn't change much. It's beta, P, R, O, P. And now the impedance looking down. It's what? Like the one I had up there before. It's beta and R1. So what's my total output impedance? It's beta, P, R, O, P in parallel with beta and R, O, N. Right? This is Vn, and now this current is what? This is Gm Vn. Good. Now, what is the current driving the output? It's not this current, it's this current, right? How is it related to that? Alpha. Alpha times, right? Because we have, this is the inner current, this is the collector current. This is alpha. So it's alpha Gm Vn driving. So my gain, if I were to write it exactly, would be minus alpha gm um, beta p r o p in parallel with beta n r o n. Right? Fine. So what is my gain? Well, alpha is kind of bigger alpha. So let's say it's one for all fractions for, for our numerical calculation, right? So that's one million, this is still 40 millisiemens. Now, beta PROP, we have already calculated, was five mega. Now, what is that? Well, RON was 100 kilo, right? So that beta, let's say beta 100 is about 10 kilo, 10 mega. So what is this? Parallel combination. Something like 3.3 mega ohm, 3 .3 mega ohm <coughs> times 40 millisiemens. So milli and mega gives me a thousand. So that would be something like 12. Right. Yeah. Uh, 
the library. <laughs> first of all, there are a couple of practical and theoretical limitations, right? Let's talk about the theoretical one for a second. Now, could I use another one of these? Could I use a third one, Let's say up here? Would that improve my performance? Yes? No? How many people would say, how many people say yes? It would improve my output, increase my output. Right. How many people say no? How many people say, take the safe bet and say nothing? <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> Not good, actually. <laughs> good that you acknowledge it. But, um, so, think about it. Let's, let's do a quick thing. Here, if this RS, let me ask you this question. If this RS was were infinite, what could this output resistance be? R Big R O. Yeah. Right? So, if this is R O, this is beta R O. Even if this guy were infinite, this wouldn't be beyond beta R O, so this would remain a beta R O. So in the case of my polar transistor actually going beyond 2 does not help because of that term. <laughs> now, you'll see actually in the case of MOSFETs, it's not true. Why? Because think about it. The MOSFET, you don't have the base current. In other words, your beta is infinity already. So in MOSFETs, when you do the calculations, you will see that you can cascade them indefinitely, at least in theory, and keep increasing your output resistance. Well, why the bipolar it doesn't? Because of the beta. But, so that's one. But now, that's a kind of theoretical thing. But from a even practical perspective, what happens if I could do this, right? I mean, if I could get something like 100 megavolts, would that increase my gain indefinitely? There must be some other limit, right? Something else should come out. The base transport factors. Uh, well, the alpha beta, that's a multiplicative factor, right? right. That just multiply it. It's not going to be more much of a Power supply. Well, yeah, your head drum is also reduced. Basically, if you, if you think about it, you, every transistor you add, you are reducing the amount of swing you can have on the output. We haven't talked about that extensively, but just this can't go as high because these guys will go into saturation at some point. But that's, that, let's say I'm, I'm willing to live with that because if I have such a high gain, it will happen over a very limited range anyway. That's not a big deal. So either I'm in that range or I'm not. So. Is noise an issue? Hmm? Is noise an issue? Noise could be an issue, but yeah, that's not the primary thing. The primary thing is that there are other things connected to this thing, right? In real world, these are made out of physical materials. And it, there is no such a thing as an ideal insulator. Even silicon dioxide has a resistivity non-infinite resistivity or non-zero conductivity. So other things that are connected to this start, the leakage current of those things become important. And you are limited by those other resistors as opposed to the resistance of these things. So these become inconsequential and those things have to be put in parallel with this thing and they will be dominant. So no matter how much you increase these, they will limit you. That's why there's a limit to how much you can achieve because practically then you are limited by the leakage resistance of the gate or you know the metals, you know that I have metal lines going over um, you know, the dioxide and natural leak current and all those things. Because think about it, for one megavolt, to have one megavolt, on one volt, you, have, you need one microamp. If you are at 100 megaohms, well, let's say one, let's say one gigaohm, you're talking about a nanoamp. It doesn't take a whole lot of leakage current. Okay. So, let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll start talking about MOSFETs. Any questions on this? Yes. If I would place a third one on top of this, like a third uh, P transistor on uh -huh. the second one, how exactly does the resistance change looking like from V out and upwards? That would be exactly the beta or still. Still beta. Yeah, right? Exactly just what I said. Think about it. Let's put the third one here. This is what we already analyzed, right? So what is this? What is the resistance here? Beta or beta? Right. That